right, hello everyone. Thank you for coming. This is uh, the graduate student talk with Maria Gabriella Carucci. Um, a lot of you are here for the Connect at the List event, which is a um, graduate student networking event for art students in the greater Boston area. Um, but we also have the uh, graduate student talk here that is meant to expand on our exhibitions using their expertise in a similar subject matter. Um, I'm Cassidy Westron, the Public Programs Coordinator here at the List Visual Arts Center, which is MIT's Contemporary Art Museum. So this talk is also being live streamed via Facebook, and so we'll have a Q&A at the end where you'll be able to ask any questions, um, but just know that you'll be on the live stream. Uh, tonight you'll be hearing from Maria Gabriela Carucci here, a Venezuelan-born architect, researcher, and designer, currently pursuing a Master of Science in Architecture Studies and Urbanism. Her work is driven by a passion for history, heritage, data narratives, and multimedia storytelling. Tonight, she will discuss her work on pigeon politics as it relates to the bird's ability to historically thrive and differently from what anthropogenic purposes for them have been, resulting in an established, albeit heavily contested, place in the ecosystem of modern cities around the world. Carucci will use her research to expand on Sophie Friedman Papa's and TJ Shin's practice that relates to topics of contemporary forms of surplus value production and the relationship between histories of nature and conditions of late capitalism. Thank you so much for being here and showing interest in our programming. And now let's hear from Gabby Carucci. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Cassidy. Um, thank you for being here today. It is really an honor to be able to speak and react to this incredible exhibition by Sophie and TJ. Um, also, thanks again to Cassidy Westron, the coordinator of public programs here at the Least Star Center who was responsible for setting up this talk and reaching out to me. Um, I am gonna start by reading a small piece of fiction, if you will, that I wrote in reaction to Sophie's parafiction, which if you haven't already spent time to and, and sat with both pieces in the exhibition, I highly recommend that. It. it takes 10 minutes each and they're amazing. Um, so my story said on the morning that I visited a pigeon keeper's roof in Brooklyn in New York City in 2022. So parts of it and what is said actually happened. The keeper's name is Michael Scott, and he is one of the last mumblers in Brooklyn, meaning he is one of the few people left who keep and fly pigeons from the roof of the building where he owns a pet supply store. Uh, I will then introduce and briefly discuss my work, which explores the New York pigeon as an urban agent slash citizen whose body transforms over time as a direct manifestation of the evolution of the city itself through a series of drawings. Uh, three of which are displayed here, and how it engages with the work of the exhibition, specifically Sophie's work on cycladic dope coats in the island, in, in, in Greek islands, and cycles of production and consumption of nature. In God we trust, all, o all others pay cash. No refunds, no credit, the answer is no. If you're buying or selling pigeons, we need to see your identification. No exceptions, this means you. I wake up thinking about the sign. I don't know I could read until I was promoted to the roof. I know I keep waking up thinking about the same words, like a mantra in my head, over and over and over. I guess if you spend enough time cooped up indoors, you'll learn anything to pass the time. I'm sure I'm not the first one to learn how to read. One of my previous coopmates knew how to read the word pizza, I'm certain. It's the reason why his spot is empty now. I heard Michael cursing about it one night. They strayed far too, uh, too far too often, distracted by the blinking neon letters on the other side of the block. I quickly realized what woke me up. Michael is inside the coop, ushering us out. I waddle out of my cubicle and sleepily fly onto one of the beams on the roof of the wooden shack. The sun has barely started to come out above the even skyline of Brooklyn brownstones, and the silver paint from the building's roof catches some of the light. Interesting, I think. The hatch on the floor is open, and I see a person climbing out of it. That's when I notice the other two women already standing in front of the coop. They're huddled close together, it, it's cold, I guess, and their eyes move, taking in the three structures that, once ubiquitous staples of certain boroughs and buildings, now stand as a manifestation of the remnants of a subculture and of dubious legalities. The two dovecotes where we're kept flank either end of the roof, 
two wooden and chicken wire punctuation marks of urban fauna in a sea of increasingly gentrified developments. A hawk cage on the floor completes the triangle of unlikely structures. Michael attaches a black flag, a plastic trash bag, to the end of a 30-foot long PVC pole. These are not the first people to come watch us fly, or rather, watch Michael tell us what to do. I hear the train approaching on the elevated tracks adjacent to the parapet. Either by deliberate timing or pure coincidence, Michael raises the flag as the first car whips past us, adding to the screeching sound of metal of the wheels on the tracks, a cacophony of wings beating as we take off from the ground. As if we're one body composed of 147 beaks, crops, and gizzards, and 294 tiny eyes. There's a hierarchy among us, not only between those of us who are not owned and lived under the awnings of the city and in the crevices of building facades, but also between our two coops. I hear Michael addressing one of the human girl's questions. Those, those are the special ones, he says. They're all looking at the coop facing us. The chicken wire covers the front of the structure, rendering it transparent and making it look like a trophy display case. Organic oregano, wheat germ, liquid vitamins, iodine, apple cider vinegar. As I fly in circles with the rest of the flock, I list in my head the other words I've learned how to read. These are the names of the containers kept next to the coop, our breakfast, lunch, and dinner. If you are what you eat, then this separates us further from our unkept counterparts in the city, but ironically connects us to our ancestors from 70 years ago. No refunds, no credits. This means you. Organic oregano, wheat germ, iodine. We keep circling. A hawk, keep, uh, a, a hawk starts chasing us. One of the very same hawks the city bought to manage their rat problem. Pigeons are just unfortunate collateral. Come on, everybody in, let's go. I hear Michael whistle. Come on, let's go. Every time, it's the same damn characters that make the same scene. Every week, it's the same scene. Some of them are rule breakers. He is waving the trash bag flag, calling us back, but today we don't stop flying and circling, caught up in the wind created by our own wings. We, keep, we pick up momentum. We can't stop. I can't see the hawk anymore. The roof and the buildings and the sky don't exist and are everywhere. In God we trust, all others pay cash. Liquid vitamins, apple cider vinegar. I feel heavy, too heavy, as if my bones were suddenly filled with lead. We all slow down and land and crash on top of the pigeon coop. The top of the shack is now painted in silver paint droppings. And the building ceilings, as far as the eye can see, are now covered instead with a thick layer of fresh guano. Michael, feet covered up to the ankles in bird poop, keeps waving the flag unbothered. The human visitors are slowly sinking into the roof, no longer solid, corroded by the nitrogen of the droppings. I go back into my cubicle and close my eyes. I don't know what will happen to them. After all, I'm just a pigeon. Please, don't put your fingers in the bird cages. We'll not be responsible for any injuries. Thank you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm going to move on to explaining the, the, very quickly the premise of the project. Um, so Cassidy started talking to me as, as she explained when she came across a project I had done uh, more than I have done like I did more than a year ago for my first semester's urban pro seminar class here at the Smarks program. Um, for this class, we had to create an urban atlas that explored one specific urban element of our choosing. As you might have inferred, I chose the New York City pigeon. Uh, some of my peers were, cho were choosing rice fields and rivers, and, and I chose pigeons. Uh, where I used to live in, in New York before coming to MIT, and I had daily run-ins and interactions with pigeons, so I it became an obsession of a sort. Um, so the atlas started with a manual and a map of a pigeon itself. Uh, I was trying to understand the city through its own eyes in a way, uh, which is why a couple of representational choices were made. The drawings are originally 11 inches high by 24 inches uh, wide, which is the equivalent of the average pigeon's height and wingspan. Um, and pigeons have a broad range of vision. They can see all that we can, uh, plus the addition of UV light. Uh, uh, the colors found in the drawings and map in this atlas are trying to reflect in a way the way a pigeon sees the world, much like my story earlier tried to do. Um, the second drawing, uh, which we also don't see here, is a historic timeline of the New York City pigeon. As an overview, it spans from prehistoric times to 3,000 years before the Common Era when it's thought that uh, 
In some regions in Egypt, uh, pigeons were the first bird to be domesticated in the world. Um, not sure that is, I don't know. Pigeons um, to 1606, when the first ship carrying pigeons arrives in North America, to 1864, when the guano trade wars begin uh, between Spain and Peru, and all other conflicts about control over the nitrogen that pigeon excrement carries are happening. And of course, pigeons don't really know of borders, uh, so then there's evidence of hundreds of thousands of pigeons being used as war assets all over the world at time. And then all the way to 2007, for example, when a New York City councilman proposes a ban on feeding pigeons in public spaces. Uh, these three drawings, plus the two I just spoke about, are part of a larger series of eight drawings. Um, I was trying to understand the relationships that exist between pigeons and the city using the bird's physiognomy and, and anatomical parts as markers for certain key conditions such as the relationship between the pigeon's stomach and the broad range of topics that emerge around their diet, people who feed them in parks, complaints about their feces overlaid with district income maps. And so the drawings go through their gastric and cardiac systems, their brains, their feet and wings, and as the main recipients of the violent forms of architecture, design, and policies that humans have implemented to reduce what they consider to be an invasive species, even though we made them exactly what they are nowadays. Um, all the way to their eyes, through which I frame an, an analysis of conspiracy theories that believe that birds aren't real uh, and that they're all government surveillance devices. When I was creating this, um, this drawing, which um, it's hard to see from far away, um, I was trying to sketch the relationship between the structures, uh, although technically presenting an aerial perspective from the height where the pigeons would have been flying, paradoxically diverges from a pigeon's or any bird's typical perception. Then I started thinking about the term bird's eye view, which is commonly used in architecture, um, and how not worth it is in its irony. While it invokes the perspective of a bird soaring high above, it often neglect, uh, neglects to consider the actual experience or needs of the bird or the, actual, uh, or the natural environment it inhabits. Instead, it serves merely as a convenient label for a particular viewpoint, emphasizing the observer's elevated position without truly acknowledging the lived reality of the bird. In this context, the bird's eye view becomes not only a visual perspective, but also a metaphor for the human-centric mindset that pervades architectural representation and urban planning. This disconnect underscores a deeper issue in human-nature relationships, the tendency to view nature solely through the lens of human convenience and dominance by appropriating the bird's viewpoint without considering the bird itself, the term reinforces a hierarchical relationship where nature exists primarily for human use and consumption. It highlights the need for a more, more holistic approach that considers the perspectives and experiences of all living things, including non-human entities, in shaping our built environment and understanding our place within the natural world. So for me, the forms of expanded cinema in this exhibition um, serve as a non-direct counteraction to the architectural projection of the bird's eye view. I had a chance to talk to Sophie, um, the creator of this piece and some of the drawings, about her work for a bit. And we were discussing the value of a multimedia multifocal approach to one narrative, specifically through her, uh, through her displaying her narrative through an inverted camera obscura, uh, which is what you see right here. She mentioned how by rendering the text, which the viewer expects to be able to be read in its entirety, illegible at different points due to the analog nature of the projection, the public is implicated now in a physical way, trying to understand the piece and are projecting it into the narrative themselves. If the bird's eye view, alongside the perfectly curated photos of a newly renovated Cycladic Dovecoat Airbnb listing, are clear, all-encompassing renditions of a place where the goal is to be able to take a whole story in from one perspective or snapshot, then these two pieces do the total opposite. And to end, I've been reflecting on how overlooked entities or subjects can offer valuable insights into history and human memory. Human memory as a collective is inherently flawed, leading to a recurring pattern of events globally. We often fail to fully acknowledge or understand the complexities of historical occurrences, especially when they involve seemingly mundane aspects of daily life like pigeons or plants, or looking at perfectly curated Airbnb photos and thinking about them. These encounters occur within, the specific, within specific historical contexts, yet we frequently overlook the broader historical narratives that shape their existence. 
Understanding the anthropogenic shifts in how we perceive and utilize both natural and artificial elements is crucial in comprehending the world that we inhabit today. Thank you.